Chuck Everett for a, as a valued sponsor of the lectures. And additionally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the support of the executive board of the Melbourne Historical Society, whose members are Valerie Beaver, Rob Jones, Linda Court, John Meckley, Joe Moser, Joe Nunn, Deb Owens, Anne Marie Sagnano, Jim Champanor, George Venus, all of are under the very capable leadership of President uh, Tim Bittner. I don't ask, well, those people here would stand so we can kind of recognize you? And you are, you're the members of the board. Don't be shy. <laughs> As a historian, on a personal note here, I commend the board members for their commitment to preserving and promoting not only local history, but also for supporting broader topics of interest through these lectures. Melton is fortunate to have such an organization devoted to keeping history relevant for us. As you walk through the lobby area, you, you hope, I hope you picked up a something that looks like this. It's a very brief survey. We are uh, only three years old here as a lecture series, so still in our infancy and still learning and trying to match the, the needs of, in, of in, the interest with the audience, with our speakers and topics, and we are hoping to take a half a minute or so to fill out some information that could help us do that. The zip code, by the way, if you're wondering, is simply to help us for advertising and, and, and marketing needs, trying to determine who, who our audience is. So we thank you for that. I've been hearing the name Jeff Work for many years. 
usually in the same sentence the Civil War historian. And so I'm delighted to finally have had the pleasure of meeting him. <laughs> Jeff earned his bachelor's degree at Lock Haven University and his master's degree at Penn State University. He is a retired Penn Valley High School American history teacher. I think it's fair to say that if ever there was a Civil War buff, he is it. He is also a prolific author, nine books on the subject, uh, while teaching high school men. So that alone impresses me, and I might be interested in hearing a lecture just on how he did that. How he did there and all that. Some of his titles include Calvaryman of the Lost Cause, which is a biography of Jeb Stewart, The Sword of Lincoln, focusing on the Army of the Potomac, Mosby's Rangers, and a title that grabbed my attention immediately, Longstreet, the Confederacy's most controversial soldier. His book, Gettysburg Day 3, was nominated for a National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize in 2001. After doing some research, I understand why his work was considered for such a prestigious award when I read some of the book reviewers' comments. Excellent! Exclamation part, read one. A fine and well-balanced study of the third day of Gettysburg. Maybe the definitive story of this part of the battle, read another. Gettysburg, day three, is well-written and well-researched. It is so detailed that you come away from the book feeling as if you had, at least vicariously, been at Gettysburg on July 3rd, 1863. And I'm thinking an author can't ask for much higher praise. Then, about two weeks ago, I received an email from a person asking me if Jeff would be available for a book signing. And then what every author loves to hear, I am a fan of his writings. So I encourage Jeff to bring books, and yes, he will gladly sign them. His most recent book, which I recently spotted at Barnes & Noble store in Lewisburg, is Civil War Barons. And we are indeed fortunate to have him with, have him with us this afternoon to talk about that topic as it relates to businessmen and union costs. Please welcome Jeff Word. Well, good afternoon. Boy, nice to see all you folks come out here. It was, uh, maybe some of you are hard up for entertainment on Sunday. <laughs> I'm not so sure. Uh, as you heard, I'm a history teacher. Was uh, some of you, I'm sure maybe teaching now or were. You know how precious and rare questions are when you teach. I always joke, if I got one a semester, I was happy. From the students. So if any of you have questions, please. Can you hear me? Yeah. Are you all right? No, okay, I'll do this. Okay, all right. Uh, anyhow, please, if you have any questions, ask. Also, I did bring some books along on my new one. Look, I think, I'm not here as a Yankee pet. If you want to buy a book, my wife's sitting there. She has a few. We don't have many. I appreciate it. Don't. That's fine, too. I'm here to give you a talk on these people. The Civil War began, as you well know, in 1861. And everybody at the time thought the war was not going to last long, right? In fact, there was a Southern politician who said he would drink every bit of blood that was spilled in the war. I assume that's why he became a politician, because he didn't know anything. But anyhow, uh, uh, nevertheless, you know, the war comes, and, and you heard it, the North. What did the North have? Well, the North had more men, they had more natural resources, they had more man-made resources, uh, they had more railroads, all the advantages that you would want to in the war. Just for an example, in the county surrounding Hartford, Connecticut, in 1860, there was Colt there, Sharps there. They produced, these private firms produced more firearms than all the future 11 states of the Confederacy at the time. So if you're going to war, you want to have all those advantages. But as I said, everybody in 1861 thought that the war would be brief. 
And then comes in July the 1st, 1861, the Battle of Bull Run or Manassas, and the Union armies routed. And suddenly there's this realization that this war is going to last longer than we anticipated. But the problem was the Confederacy. Yeah, they had all these disadvantages. I just named them. But the Confederacy consisted of 750,000 square miles. The Appalachian chain went right up through the spine of it. I mean, that's a formidable barrier. Rivers intersected it. Along thousands of miles of coastline. So what did the North have to do to win the war? Well, they had to conquer the South. They had to take the war to the Confederacy if they hoped to win it. You just simply can't do that. The other problem was in 1861, our federal government was so unlike today. It really is. Uh, the regular army, officers and men consisted of 16,000 men. Just to put it in perspective, on July the 1st, 1863, at Gettysburg, 17,000 men were casualties. So if you think about that in that context, and they're scattered particularly along forts along the coast or out on the frontier, uh, they're not prepared. The civilian workforce of the United States government in 1860 consisted of a little more than 35,000 people. Present. Well, the problem with that was over 30,000 just worked for the post office. And you know as well as I do that every town in America had one of the post office and had one. So the government itself, if we think of the government in Washington and elsewhere, it consisted of probably maybe 5,000 people. So how do you do this? How are you going to conquer this vast confederacy? You're going to have to do it with your armies. And your armies are going to have to go there. But the armies needed to be the old Napoleonic statement that army travels on his stomach. It does travel on his stomach. It travel needs to be armed, equipped. But we only had one, two armories. One in Springfield, Massachusetts, right after the other in Harpers Ferry, Virginia, which was soon captured by the Confederates, so that's out of it. You have to rely on private business. But what you need to do is you have to mobilize all these resources and businesses on a scale that our country had never seen before. It's simply never seen before. You have to organize it. You have to also have a government to bring this organization to it. Probably somebody you've never heard of, really. Maybe Montgomery Miggs. Montgomery Miggs was one of the heroes of the Civil War for the North. He was quartermaster general. He was the one responsible, and he had the talent and the genius. If you want to know who Montgomery Briggs is, you want to see it. Every night you see the news, and they show, give you a shot at the uh, Capitol and the dome at Montgomery Briggs. He was the engineer that started building the dome of the, of the Capitol building. Uh, and also he built the aqueduct that served Washington that still does, I think, in some regards. But anyhow, so he oversees it. But what they have to do is rely on private industry. So when I was looking at this, I decided to look at men who contributed by their efforts to the war. And there are 19 of them. Uh, we'll show, talk about them. Uh, some of them you're going to be very familiar with. That was one of the criteria. They're quite an eclectic group. Also, I've got to tell you something. Uh, when I was proposing my book to a publisher, I thought, OK, now I'm going to write it with and I'm going to uh, right, in each chapter I deal with two men. So I finished all my research and generally took me about two years to do all the research and all that. And I got everything organized and I had 19 men. Which is not particularly smart if you're going to do two men in every chapter. <laughs> Fortunately, what I did was I devoted one chapter to the man who probably revolutionized how we deal with war. And I'll talk about him. So, now what follows, and I have to admit to you, given my age, this is an old man's version of a PowerPoint presentation, okay? <laughs> so we'll begin with the first photograph. <laughs> smart, 
she types everything, she edits everything, and so yeah, here we are. <laughs> There's another version of our. Anybody know who he is? Simon Cameron. Simon Cameron. Thank you. What was he? Absolutely correct. And I put him in here because of the men who follow. Of course, Daddy Stevens said the only thing Simon Cameron wouldn't steal was a red hot stove. Uh, <laughs> he is ethically challenged. Uh, and he will be sent to Russia in January of 1862. So they got rid of him. But I put him in here because he's involved heavily in the early thing. And he's the Secretary of War in 1861. This man's a Pennsylvanian from Philadelphia. I know some of these you won't know. This is J. Edward Thompson. Now, why is he president of the Pennsylvania Railroad? And J. Edward Thompson, in the early days when you know the crisis was, remember Maryland, they don't know whether Maryland's going to go free or sl remain slave to the pro-Confederacy or not. He is going to help to funnel troops down to it. He and Cameron working together. And during the war, and this is what I looked at, how they not only contributed to the war, but what happens as a result of it. They would buy up railroad lines because they have a lot right now. Again, not so much him, but the next person. You know, their ethics in those days were a little bit different than our ethics today. And, you know, they're, well, you know, like Cameron made sure that a lot of the goods material was funded on the North Central Railroad. Guess who owned the North Central Railroad? Thompson and Cameron and a few other people. But Thompson was a brilliant man, brilliant businessman. Uh, what you probably heard of, did you ever hear of the J. Edgar Thompson Steel Mill in, Pet in Pittsburgh? It's named for him because of the man who beat his, one of his protégés. Anyhow, by the war's end, the Pennsylvania Railroad system is the greatest in the eastern United States, thanks to this man. And this man here. Other Pennsylvania from Franklin County. Thompson was from Philadelphia. This, you know, I know Thomas A. Scott. It's Thomas A. Scott. Yeah. He becomes Assistant Secretary of War under Cameron. And he will be in that position until 1862 in June. He is a brilliant. They said after the war he's the most important railroad executive in American history during the Gilded Age. You probably hardly ever heard of him, right? Because we hear of other ones, certainly. But he was the number two man under Thompson in the Pennsylvania Railroad. Worked his way right up through. Uh, and I included these two in the chapter together, obviously, because of their importance uh, to the Pennsylvania Railroad. He would, when um, the United States uh, had to send uh, two corps of the Army to the West in the September 1863, create quite a logistical problem. The government brought Thompson back in and said, you take care of what he did. And he transported to the 11th and 12th Corps from the Army of the Potomac to the West, and he was very good. This man is the one I devoted an entire chapter to. He's from Ohio, but his business was out of Philadelphia. This is Jay Cook, often called the financier of the Civil War. Jay Cook revolutionizes America finances its wars. He became the sole agent for the issuing of bonds because other ones didn't want to take it on. He said he would do it, he'd sell them at par. What he does is he comes up with, first of all, Pennsylvania, by the way, he's in Philadelphia. Pennsylvania was in debt. And so Jay Cook came up, they hired Jay Cook to sell bonds. He sold them to ordinary people. He said, Look, you guys support the cause. Patriotism. Why are you supporting the cause? You can make some money. And so he combined self interest with patriotism, and ultimately, the war cost the Union government $3.2 billion in that day and age. And uh, Jay Cook and his sales are probably responsible for a little over $2 billion. It wasn't a long, but primarily. But what, what you all, look, I remember the 1950s going to elementary school. You know, we, we could buy uh, little stamps and put in books to fight the Russians, right? The communists. World War I, I want you. This is Jay Cook. That's what the government decided to do, how we can finance selling bonds to the American people for our wars. 
And that's why I ended up devoting the entire chapter to this man. He's a remarkable individual. But he ends up being, uh, his world's changed. In 1873, his banking company went bankrupt. His bankruptcy triggered one of the worst recessions in American history. Just one company. Because he was heavily involved in people and investments. If you know this man, I'll be shocked. See, there are various people here that they What he created is a National Historic Landmark in St. Louis, Missouri. After the war, he built a bridge across the Mississippi. It's called the Eads Bridge, E-A-D-S. This is James B. Eads. James Buchanan Eads. His mother was a cousin of the President of the United States. Her family came to St. Louis when he was 12 years old. As the ship was landing, caught fire, everybody escaped it with Eads family and nothing but, to, as they said, the clothes on their back. He was, uh, as a 12-year-old, was selling apples and other things in the streets of St. Louis, but he was a brilliant engineer, figured out how to salvage sunken ships in the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. He could walk in the bottom of the rivers, pumping air up through, and he made, made a fortune doing that. And uh, when, when the war came, they needed boats, gunboats, ships that could be fight on the rivers. And he came up with, uh, got a contract for eight boats. This is an example of one of them. They all look like this. This is a USS Louisville. He named them primarily for uh, cities. If you look at them, they call them, uh, the designer was a man, a man named Samuel Polk. They call them Polk's turtles because they thought they looked like turtles floating on the river. But they're instrumental. If you ever heard of campaigns of Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson, U.S. Grant, and all those, this is what he did. But he would then build a monitor and so forth uh, that was more revolutionary than the monitor that uh, uh, er Erickson built. This actually, folks, I'll tell you. I I like to, my wife and I both like to watch PCN. You know, they do those tours. And I'm always fascinated by the machinery because I'm in depth about those things. Now, how the devil do they do these machines? This, this fellow here is probably the one man I think most remarkable of all, only because of what he does. Scottish immigrant, came to America in the 1830s. His name is Henry Burden, B-U-R-D-E-N. He settles in Troy, New York. And he gets involved in the now iron foundry. He eventually, he will own the foundry. In the 18, I think 1837, he invented a machine to cast horseshoes. And in 1857, he got a new patent. There used to be a three-step process. He could cast a horseshoe in one step. Why is that important? By the time Civil War comes, his company could cast a horseshoe every second. I did the math. <laughs> uh, when they said how many horseshoes they produced during the Civil War, I said, can. 70 million. And horseshoes, if any of you knows, I'm, you know, I think you need uh, some eight oh, shoes for a horse sizes and four for mules. And they could run them through. And I did the math, you know, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, every second. Yeah, he could produce 70 million. Remarkable man. Uh, Henry Burden, and uh, he's in my book. Uh, this fella is the only one whose company was number one as far as producing. Name's Robert P. Parrott. He owned the West Point Foundry. He produced cannon and artillery shells. They produce more cannon and artillery shells than any other company in America. The upstream from West Point. He, he was a West Point graduate, married into the family that owned the, owned the foundry. And uh, what he did is, and you can see it here, I brought it along. They are going to the breach of the cannon. See how this it's wrapped, it's reinforced. They, that's what he did. And he could do it better and cheaper than anybody else. Uh, 
this is a, uh, they ran from uh, 10, 10 pounders to 300 pounders. One of the more famous ones was it's called a Swamp Angel that was in Charleston, South Carolina, Union Army, and uh, it, it, it fired shells in, you know, into Charleston, but after a while it exploded. He had some trouble with it, but uh, his, his uh, orders, Confederates, they, any time they could hold a power cannon, they did, they were rifled too. Please keep in mind, if somebody's cannon, you're, you're talking, uh, they can send a shell easily three miles. There was a cannon in Gettysburg, just for example, a Whitworth cannon, which was a British cannon. That could do at least five miles. And they said, you heard somebody said to talk about it, they said, well, it sounded like a railroad uh, uh, at rail going through the air. The noise was very distinctive in the wizard. Here's the only one that seems to be young. <laughs> so they want to find a photograph of the young. This is a quiet little Yankee, as John Hayes said. This guy revolutionary firearms. Any firearm boss? Who this guy is? Spencer. Spencer. This is Christopher Minor Spencer. Breach loading, repeating rifle. And uh, he got it. They got a contract from the Navy in 1861. And Spencer wrote, well, that's good. We have no workforce, no machinery, and no factory. But we'll do our best. Uh, <laughs> and so what they did is they rented a, pipe, a piano, second floor of a piano factory in Boston, Massachusetts. He's from Connecticut. Now, he, did, he, he was financed. His deal was simple. Uh, they paid him a, a dollar for every rifle they produced. He will outlive all of them, by the way. I get, you know, he dies in 22, 1922. But uh, I think his uh, patents end up being in the neighborhood of 20 or so. Really, really <coughs> good. But anyways, he came up. He was having a heart attack. If, you, if the government accepts a new rifle, okay, well, well, why wouldn't they accept a new rifle? You know, by the way, they didn't want to do repeaters because they said that the men would waste the ammunition. And see, in those days, government cared about how much money they spent. <laughs> okay? So there was this, you know, we have a hard time wrapping our mind around that, but anyhow, they did. And so you get these high-bound old uh, fossils in the uh, war department to accept a new weapon, you got to convince them that it's worth it. And he had a hard time with it. So finally, Thanks to Gideon Wells, who was Secretary of Navy, and, the, and his backers, who were the Cheney brothers, who owned silk mills in New England, he got an audience with Abraham Lincoln. Now, if you don't know it, Abraham Lincoln had a patent. He invented a thing that could lift river boats up the, uh, that cotton snags and stuff in rivers, because, you know, Lincoln knew the river. He, he didn't float it down the door. Uh, it didn't really work well. But he had a patent. He, well, in fact, his secretary said whenever a model of an invention came to the White House, they always had, they had orders from the president to sit to the side. And so Spencer gets an audience with Lincoln. And he says to Spencer, I want to see the inner zone. How does this new gun work? So he took it apart and showed him. Lincoln said, okay, now we're going to go out and we're going to test fire tomorrow. Because there was something that would jam. So they went down to where today the Washington Monument stands, roughly in that area. They put a board up with black marks on it. Uh, it fired seven shots. Lincoln hit the board seven times. He hit the black mark once. So then he told Spencer to shoot. I, we don't know how many times Spencer shot. All Lincoln said to him, well, you're younger than I am, you have a better eye. <laughs> You know, I don't know if the president wanted to be outshot or what, but they convinced Lincoln to buy uh, for the government. He ordered the government to Spencer rifles and Spencer carbines, which folks at the end of the war, is particularly in the East. Uh, I have to say this: the you know we think of the army that fought at Gettysburg, the Union Army, and all that. I don't want to get into this, but if you don't know this. On May the 4th, 1864, the Army of the Potomac crossed the Rapidan River in Virginia and would begin what amounted to six weeks of almost constant warfare with Robert E. Lee's army. They lost 60,000 men. More men than they lost at Antietam, Chancellorsville, and Gettysburg. 
combined uh, in that period of all. Okay, the staggering. What I'm saying to you, the only ones that were really left were the cavalry that were good. And then many of them were armed with Spencer uh, carbines. And they're very important in the last year of the war. Confederates said they're the gun to load and sun in fire all week, you know, because of the seven <laughs> shots. So they're very important. He was a remarkable young man. This fellow, if you have a copy of the book, you see that my chapters are very simple. I have the administrators, the investors, the organizers, the entrepreneurs. I have one chapter devoted to what I call the patriots. And this is one of the patriots. And this company is still in business, so it's bought out. He's a Quaker from Philadelphia, serving the United States Navy as a doctor. This is Edward Squibb. Squibb Pharmaceuticals. And in tour duties with the Navy, he could not believe how bad the chloroform and ether were, how impure they were. So he devoted his experiments to it, tried to finally the Navy placed him at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and told him to conduct experiments. And he is going to devote the years right before the war to the purification of chloroform and ether. Not only that, he published everything. He said, I want other uh, pharmaceutical companies, if you will, to know how to do it. This is to be shared. This is to save pain in men's lives for him. War comes. His factory goes into, by the way, he was badly burned in the fire. An accident, those days happened. In fact, he had to spend the rest of his lifetime his eyelids shut at night so he could sleep uh, and tape him. And uh, he never did hardly any public opinion. But anyhow, when the war came, Squibb in particular, the government came to him and he was not really interested in making money. And what he did, but you know, he one of these, his concern was the welfare and the care of the men. Uh, he also created and built what's called a veneer. It was a medical chest for doctors. And, and it, many doctors and surgeons used them in the field. It wouldn't let, I know the only one I know of is at the uh, Civil War Medical Museum in Frederick, Maryland. So if you ever get there, they say it's a wonderful museum. I have never been there, but it's what it is. This fellow, if you've heard of him, I'm going to fall over. Uh, or no. I didn't know. Well, that's, folks, you think you know something until you write a book and then you find out how profoundly ignorant you are? <laughs> you know, I knew a lot about Gettysburg in the third day. No, I didn't. <laughs> this man is Abram Hewitt, H-E-W-I-T-T. -T. He married into the Cooper family of New York City. Peter Cooper, Cooper Union, where Lincoln gave the address. And he became his best friend was Edward Cooper, the son of Peter Cooper. And Peter Cooper, before the war, bought the Trenton Iron Works. And Edward, his son, said, I want Abram to work for me. <laughs> why? <laughs> why? He, so he had to prove himself. The war comes. And they're trying to make gun metal, you know, for rifles. Right? Springfield Armory, they send their gun metal to the Springfield Armory in Massachusetts. They know it's not good enough. They keep trying, still not good enough. Abram Hewitt gets on a ship, goes to England. Now, I don't know exactly what inspired him to think this would happen. The best gun makers in the world, or gun, you know, barrels and that, were the British and the Germans. He thought that the British manufacturers would share their secrets with him. <laughs> they basically told the Yankee to go home. Well, he doesn't do that. He decides to troll the pubs. Apparently he bought a lot of ale and beer or whatever. He found a secret formula from the workers in the factories. Came back and they produced this gun metal that the uh, Springfield Armory accepted. Why is it important in this sense? Because he makes the statement is, in times of crisis like this, it's wrong to make a profit. He and Edward Cooper offered their factory in Trenton to the War Department. You can make it. You can take the money, you can make it. They said, no, no, you just go ahead and you own it and you make it. And they made very little money, and that's why he and Squibber partners. 
This man's famous. Uh, his company now makes uh, spices. This is Sarah McCormick. Okay? Uh, he, he invented the Reaper. All I can tell you is the story that, that his grandson produced is a little bit, mm, you know, his dad was working on it for years in Virginia. You ever go down 81, you ever see a sign, they had it up along 81, you can stop and see the uh, Reaper place in the farm, you know, right? Uh, I think in April of that one, 30, 1831, his dad, his father tested and didn't work. Lo and behold, his brilliant son in two months built a brand new Reaper and it worked. No, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> I think what he did was he modified his father's Reaper. And so, but by the time the war comes, Cyrus McCormick, his brother William, and his brother Leland were in Chicago. See, you got to What I found out with these men is, I think almost all of them took them today and plopped them down, they'd be all right. You know, they, they made it. He saw where his market was. His market was in slaveholding south or a reaper. It was in that black belted plains of Ohio West and in the, you know, Pennsylvania and New York. And finally, they first went to Cincinnati, and then as it's more and more evident where the farming is occurring, he goes and moves to Chicago. I will tell you, they were hoping, if you will, that they reach a settlement. Uh, the Confederate government and the Union government reach a settlement. In other words, it recognizes the Confederacy. All I want to think, the Confederacy could never win a military victory in the Civil War. You're not going to see Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia march down Broadway Avenue in New York City. That's simply, they can't do that. I know they came to get Pennsylvania in 63 to get to Harrisburg and go on east, but it never happened, right? In other words, they have to win a political settlement. They have to convince the northern people to force Lincoln to negotiate with them, and you do that with valuable victories. Anyhow, I, I know somewhat. McCormick saw that this was the open. Now, their brother, his brother William, he really wanted an outright competitor. All, they never got rid of their Virginia roots, never during the war. What do they do with all the money they make from Reapers? They invest in real estate in Chicago, and when the war's over, they're the wealthiest people in Chicago alone. And when the Great Fire comes, they just simply rebuild their factory. This fellow you all know. Carnegie. Yeah. Did you know he barely stood five feet? He wore elevated boots, sort of, to uh, make him look back. He is the Thomas Scott found him. He's a telegraph boy in Pittsburgh. And they, he, Scott somehow found out because the Western Division of Pennsylvania Railroad is in Pittsburgh. And he hired him as his private secretary. In fact, when the war came, Carnegie was the head of the Western Division of the Pennsylvania Railroad. And what, for a while, they lived in Altoona. He and his mother and his brother. Well, when Scott is ordered to Washington, he tells Carnegie, you're coming with me. Well, Carnegie asks him, I don't want to. But he does. And he will do great service for about six months in Washington, returns to Pennsylvania, and starts to invest. And just for example, according to him, he would take, he and another man took $40,000, invested it in a farm near Oil City, and that farm ended up producing for them $5 million. Okay, you know about Carnegie. You know, you, I don't have to go through all that. He only late, very late in the war is he first invented in the iron business, which will become a steel business. But I want to put in perspective, though, when he dies, no, excuse me, in 1901, Andrew Carnegie will sell out to J.P. Morgan and other investors that create U.S. Steel, right? He was paid $182 billion, okay? Now, Carnegie set up a retirement fund uh, at $44,000 a day. Oh, <laughs> now you know what 
income tax and state tax does, does to all of us, right? <laughs> this is this is pretty no, right? But this is yeah. And, and Delco giving away over ninety percent of his money. And, and our eight two billion, excuse me, is in today's dollars. I'm sorry, it's today's dollars. Look where he'd be even with one hundred eighty two billion dollars. Where he'd rank in America, right? He's right up there. But over ninety percent of it gave away. But he did set up his own retirement fund with that. But his contribution to the war is important. This man is really famous. And if you look closely at the photograph, you can probably tell me who it is. Look at the bottom of the photograph. John Deere. John Deere is a Vermonter, uh, tinkerer, blacksmith, and itinerant. Went town to town, didn't do too well, ended up in Decker's jail. Finally got out, somebody paid it. Friends of them said, Why don't you come to Illinois? It's pretty good out here. So he went to Illinois, left his wife and family, didn't, just for a while. Didn't desert him, left him to go out there and see how he'd do. He had a friend who was already there, and the friend owned a sawmill. And his friend discarded the sawmill blade. And Deer asked him whether he could have it. And he did, and that's the first plow. And what his plow did, the nose took a scowl. See, the soil out there is not Pennsylvania. It's not our good limestone soil that we all know about here. It's that dark, black, heavy, and all these wooden uh, uh, plows with just the iron. For, they, they would not, you know, clean it. They had plow so much. No, his, his uh, thing scoured. And why I say this is, and he was really smart, he advertised it so to McCormick. They put their, all about their, you know, Reaper, and I should have mentioned that, now Deer does it. You know, he advertises the newspapers. He has sales agents. They go to state and county fairs. They win ribbons. And by the late 1850s, John Deere is nearly bankrupt. But what he and wife did was produce a son who was a brilliant businessman. And his son was John, was Charles Deere, and he's the one who saves the company. And we all know it today. But they produced, the, the, the war was extremely good for John Deere's company. He ends up being the most regarded citizen, mayor of Moline for a while, and things like that. But his company thrived because of the war. These are brothers. Thank you. These are Studebaker brothers. Studenberg, Studenbecker. Three brothers came from Germany, settled in Philadelphia, kept moving west. The whole family just kept moving. It was like a family of new beginnings. And finally, two of them, Clement Henry, and they're the ones here, uh, Clement Henry, uh, they end up in South Bend, Indiana, as blacksmith. Uh, Clement borrowed $40 from his wife. Now, I don't know exactly how she squirreled away for you, but you know what I mean? <laughs> you all understand the ride, don't you? And they started this blacksmith business and wagon making business. At one point, their middle brother, the one sitting, is John Moeller, M-O-H-L-E-R. Their mother's name was Moeller, okay? And they, to distinguish him from the family, he was John Moeller. He heads west to the California globe, uh, uh, gold fields. He's going to make his fortune in gold. He gets there, meets a Yankee from, well, I think maybe Vermont, and you know, <laughs> Well, you know, the Yankees, they can see a dollar when they see it. He told him, he said, son, you're a fool if you think you're going to make money in gold. If you help me, you can make money. So what are you doing? Bill Wilbacks. Ironically, the three Studenbecker brothers, at one point when they were first here from Germany, built uh, wheelbarrows to make a living. And so it's sort of, he ends up in 1858, I think that's right, with $8,000 in his new pocket. That's how much profit he made out in California. Comes East, and Henry, they're all pacifists, folks. They're German Baptists, and they're pacifists. Henry wants to get out, because they just had done a contract with the United States Army, and Henry thought it was wrong. Make a long story short, Henry wants to uh, be bought out so he can buy a farm. John Muller says, fine, I'll invest with you. Now, their wagons, are not, they, did not, they were not the biggest wagon makers in America. I think there were 4,500 at the time when the war came. But they would make what many people regarded as one of the very best. Uh, 
you can see an example. I don't think this is necessarily a Studebaker built wagon, but see the smaller front wheels and that, and other things. They build out of hickory, a lot of them. They're very solidly built. Just to give you an example, when the Confederates come into southern Pennsylvania during the Gettysburg campaign, uh, they are going to, in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, capture 16 wagons. Okay. Folks, they stole everything that did what, you know, I believe. I mean, they, they cleaned out. You know, one of my favorite quotes, I'm sorry, this is a typical high school teacher's tangent. Uh, <laughs> One of the best quotes I've ever read was, uh, Dorsey Pender was a Confederate general. He wrote home to his wife. He's a Confederate general, educated at West Point. He said, the people of Pennsylvania, no, the folks in Pennsylvania are people of barns and not brains. They were really impressed with our barns. And I understand that. You know, you know we know that, but nevertheless. What's important about that, in a letter home about the capture of the 16 wagons, they said they were Studebakers. They, the Confederates knew about, they were called studies in most of it, but they knew about them. And they are the only one of all those wagon makers who went into the horse's carriage business over the objections of Clement and John Mulder in the 1890s. They didn't want anything to do with cars, but the, the people on the board said, no, we're going to produce cars. This guy's famous for as you ladies know him. My wife had to clarify a few things for me. This man's name is Gail Borden. This is Gail Borden. I tried, yeah, yeah, that's no. Now my wife tried to explain to me what different can eagle brand what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about in those days was sweet milk. I find this surprising. He was part of the Texas Revolution. There was a committee of five men in 1830, late 1835, that declared the Texas independence. Gail Borden was one of them. He had shifted down from the Midwest, married a young lady who was a teacher in Mississippi. And her family was moving to Texas to get all this land and stuff. So he went, well, he ends up being in the Texas Revolution. He and his brother produce a newspaper that becomes the unofficial organ of the Texas Revolution. What, folks, just, what, last week? was the fall of the Alamo, the anniversary of the Alamo fall. He, made, he, he decides to invent things and he makes a meat biscuit that all I could probably tell you was just absolutely god awful tasting. The army took a contract for it first and then the army after a well, while apparently he got feedback and the men weren't, uh, you know, they, well we don't want anything to do with this. And so they kept experimenting, experimenting. What he ended up with was creating condensed milk. You know, taking out that lasts for a long time. You know, you, you read plenty of accounts of poor dad. I mean, he sold tens and hundreds of thousands of cans of his milk to the uh, Union Army during the Civil War. And uh, he, he, I, on his tombstone, I hope I have this right, he said, I tried and failed and failed and tried and succeeded. <laughs> and that's what he did, you know, he had a heart Fortunately, he ran. You know how, I shouldn't tell you all this story. You know, there's a lot, I love, what I like about history a lot is irony. I think it's just, what, he was, he was broke. He, he moved, came east, started a factory, he wasn't, you know, he just wasn't making it. It looked like this meat biscuit, again, just did that milk. And he's riding on a train into New York City, ends up sitting with a young fella, and he started talking. This young fella's an investor. And he thought, this is a really good idea. Say, Borden didn't come. You know, however. <clears throat> this guy, is, uh, I'm sure you've never heard of him either. I know, I, uh, this is an eclectic group. But this is, I picked them, so, you know, I can't say that it's strange. Uh, this man is Gordon McKay. Who is he? Well, he. In 1858, bought the rights to a machine that stitched the uppers of a shoe or boot to the soles. He refined it and it ended up being called McKay Stitcher. The Union government will uh, purchase 10 million pairs of boots and shoes during the Civil War. 
Thank you, Reena. I probably heard they call, they're called brogans and the men wore. Uh, they wore out a lot, but over half of them, as far as we know, were made by the McKay stitcher. All right? Why is it interesting? Because he didn't, he took a royalty. He franchised it, like Ray Karak. He got so much for every shoe. Yeah, you could have my machine, I'll give you my machine now, but every time you produce a pair of shoes, you owe me some pennies. And he made a fortune. <laughs> I take all these guys into the post four years just to tell you. I even tell you where they're all buried. I thought, I, I always, well, never mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, my grandchildren complain about when we go somewhere, we always have to go to the cemetery. But anyhow. <laughs> But uh, what it was like is, I gotta tell you, Gordon McKay is widowed. Okay? He marries the daughter of his housekeeper. She has two children. They end up being divorced. And Gordon McKay said, They are not my children. He did not denies paternity. Okay? She goes and meets a German baron. And she planning to get married. And McKay, her ex-husband, gives the, the new couple a million dollars as a wedding present. It's an inexplicable to me, but that's what he did. But anyhow, why is more important now? He will fund, and they're still today, he funds 40 scholarships and fellowships at Harvard University <coughs> of Engineering, and people are still benefiting from it today. Wow. So, from McKay's stitcher. And after the war, more patents, refines them more and more, Remarkable man. This man, you all, I, I would think one form or other used his product. This man is Phil Armour. Armour Meats. Okay? They figured out, in front of he and a partner, now, by the way, Armour is one of those that got thrown out of school as a young man because he took a young lady for a carriage ride after dark. So the school expelled. So God said, well, never mind. Ah. But anyhow, he ends up going to California. He doesn't go pan for gold either. He helps build sluices, you know, water coming down for the miners, and he makes $8,000. And he comes back, he ends up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is now, what in Cincinnati? If you don't know this, one of the names of Cincinnati for a while was called Porkopolis because they killed so many pigs in Cincinnati, Ohio, that it became known as Porkopolis. But one of the other places that was very good was Milwaukee. He ends up in partnership with this man. I feel, uh, that's a name, by the way. And uh, they are going to figure out how you get four hands out of a, a, a hog. And they are going to do canned meats and stuff, and it was selling during the war. But what he does, late in the war, the betting is, you know, there's a market for it, and meat and nothing put down. He realized, as he said later, I was betting on U.S. Grant, and U.S. Grant Lincoln, and he said, they're going to win it. Grant's going to win this war. He went to New York with his partner's permission, and he bought uh, futures of uh, hogs, and they all thought he was crazy. Well, was, when the war ends, right? And he made, I think, $2 million, like almost overnight, came back, and eventually they moved to Chicago. You know about Armour and all that. And Armour and uh, the state of Swift will dominate the uh, uh, meat uh, producing in the Gilded Age. This guy here, this company's still in business, German immigrant. This is Frederick Weyerheiser. Okay? Came here from Germany. Family got out. He inherited some money. Went, ended up in Illinois. He and his brother-in-law would go into business together in Lumberville. Uh, he started working there for another company. Uh, people owned it. They go bankrupt. He bought it. And uh, he will go into it. What's interesting about this is a man who everything, he's a German, and everything in life was ordered, you know. Family, church, business. I don't know if it's that order, but you know what I mean? It was that kind of thing. Except 
during the war, while his brother-in-law is running the mill, he's going through the Midwest buying up acreage or timber rights. And when the war is over, guess what? At one point, he controlled 50 timber associations or groups or businesses after the war. Now, that's into the 70s and 80s. But he's a remarkable man. Now, you never would have thought that possible. But that's him. Now, this guy's a little bit of not... I know, I've introduced you to Carnegie, and you know, Carnegie is one of the robber barons. This guy was probably a little bit of a shyster even during the war. Very famous. Ever been to the Bill Yeah. This is Cornelius Vanderbilt. Okay? Young man, Stanton Allen, Stanton Allen, excuse me, uh, got into the ferrying business as a 16 year old. Started to make money. Time went on, he was in shipbuilding. By the time the war came, he's very well. Of all these men, this man's the wealthiest when the war comes. Vanderbilt Bill's worth a lot of money. He built the largest steamship in the world, and he named it the Vanderbilt. Okay? The war comes. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy over his ships and so forth. If you remember correctly, in March of 1862, there's a famous battle between the two ironclads. The USS Monitor and the CSS Virginia. Well, it was the, the day before, on March the 8th, the CSS Virginia came down the James River uh, saying two wooden warships and ran another in the ground, and everybody's in a panic. Secretary of War Edwin Stanley said, paced to, up, the, upstairs to the White House looking out the river of the Potomac to see the CSS Virginia coming up through. Vanderbilt said, look, I'll loan you my ship. We can defeat the CSS Virginia. So the government accepted Okay? Worth a billion dollars, folks. Then, right? What <laughs> But Vanderbilt apparently didn't understand was they figured it was a gift. And they never gave it back. <laughs> they gave him a medal, which I don't know what exactly he did with, but uh, but where he the shyster was, all this money he had, what he starts to do to invest in railroads. And he can manipulate the stock market in New York City and like nobody else. And by that time the war's end, he's a major invest investor in the one railroad company that's going to challenge the Pennsylvania, and that's the New York Central. Okay, but this is Vanderbilt. That's what he contributes to the war. This is the last fella, and it's railroads too. This guy was born in Connecticut in a place called Poverty Hollow. Want to know how bad it was? Astonishing. He and his brother were actually taken by the selectmen from their family and taken away because the family was so poor. This is Collis P. Huntington. Yeah. Yeah. He ends up going to California and he's a merchant and he gets involved with three, three other merchants who knew absolutely nothing about building a railroad. They called themselves the Associates, but they had this engineer who had a dream of a transcontinental railroad. Okay, so they, they sent this engineer to Washington when the war began, and uh, Huntington followed. Now, the president of the company was Leland Stanford. Okay, Huntington's most remarkable was the Huntington Library, which is one of the great libraries in America. Anyhow, they go to Washington, either the engineer or Huntington brings along 60 some thousand dollars and it's dispensed. Okay. The engineer ends up being the secretary of the House Committee on Railroads and secretary of the Senate Committee on Railroads. Now, how is that possible? Right? And the heads of both of them are from California. They passed the Pacific Railway Bill in 1862. Guess who gets a contract for the western end of this? The Associates. 
who absolutely are going to make money. They're the Central Pacific Railroad Company. And they do what the Union Pacific does. They set up their own construction company, which they own. And they are going to be all right. The uh, Union, uh, Union Pacific, you know, Credit Mobier and all that scandal. But these guys end up uh, uh, doing all right. But they're, again, this is the ethics of it. That's the last 19 of them. Uh, as I said to you, I, I think the best thing I've learned from this, uh, you can find remarkable individuals anytime. We know what some of these companies they produced and end up with, but their effort to the Union War was considerable. Most of them, by the way, were abolitionists, anti-slavery, if not abolitionists. They were devoted to the Union cause and also devoted to making money. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, I know that um, a Frenchman invented candy food. What, do you know what year that was? That, that must have been before the Civil War if they had canned food. I don't know that, but it was definitely before the Civil War. Uh, they do, uh, archaeologists do digs today, and uh, uh, particularly uh, where they find, you know, they'll find piles and piles of what's left, not a whole lot over the years of discarded, you know, cans that are, you know. It, to locate campsites and things like that. I can't tell you that. Anybody else know when they would have? The first was a French confectioner that Napoleon needed to feed, you know, the army marched on his stomach. And he put a sheet, canned a sheet in a steel can. They didn't have tin, so it was steel, so it rusted, or it was iron. And uh, they soldered the ends with lead solder. But, and, but they didn't know about pasteurization, so this meat was always questionable as to whether it was going to be any good or not. But uh, it's the equivalent of a ten thousand dollar reward for somebody to be able to package meat so that the army could march on it. Oh, there you go. I, that, it doesn't surprise me at all. To be I'll take any question. I'll make something up if I don't. Know. <laughs> No, not all of them. <laughs> now, what the numbers of them did, I mean, Squibs did, uh, I got to go through some, you probably remember. I don't think Studebakers did. McCormick's definitely did. I mean, once or twice, I mean, before the war. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, it was a major problem with fire. There's no question about that, you know. But, uh, yeah, the, they had that problem. Yes, sir. Studebakers have been oh. down in Gettysburg area for a while. Uh, East Berlin. There's a, uh, their father and mother lived there. He set up a blacksmith's, blacksmith's shop. There's a historic, uh, Pennsylvania historic marker to him. East, East Berlin is just north of Gettysburg, yes. And it was the two boys then. I so said, they just kept moving. They were in Lancaster for a while, the family, and then they kept going uh, to, uh, ended up in Adams County, some of them. And then on, they, they went to Ohio. Uh, their parents packed them up and they went to Ohio for a while and then from Ohio, Clement Henry ended up in South Bend, Indiana. Where there is, uh, by the way, a student baker you see. There's a, major, there's a lot of student baker nuts who are floating around the world. <laughs> you know, I, I don't mean that, but they, they love them. Uh, I'm a Civil War nut, so I can say that now, you know, that sense, but yeah. Yes, sir. In the recent issue of the American Civil War, your book review, and I'm assuming from your book because it's quoted about Cyrus McCormick that uh, he's, uh, Stanton was supposed to have said that the rebirth is to the north what slavery is to the south and without McCormick's invention I fear the north would not have won and the union would be dismembered. Did you, in your research, do you find any uh, support for that or is that public? I quote that. I quote Stanton but I said that it was Stanton was not one for a lot of praise about anything. Uh, Stanton was a, a great Secretary of War. You don't cross him. Uh, but uh, I, what he did is he, he released how many tens and hundreds of thousands of farm boys to go into the Army because they could do with the, the Reaper would just uh, take care of That's what he meant. And he's probably, 
My idea is maybe a little bit of hyperbole, but it's, it, to be honest about this, one of the machines of that period. There's no question about that. Uh, again, as I said earlier, not only do you have you have these businesses, but you have to mobilize them and you have to organize them. You have to create a system which we never even had. And when the war is over, folks, I mean, when the war is over, the government just shuts that down. I'm telling you here. Their biggest thing is you don't spend money. I mean, we are, you can argue, just my point, I think the only war for most of our history that we were sort of prepared for when it came was World War II. Because, you know, we had this idea that, you know, John Smith, who's living on a farm, can pick up old Betsy his musket, and he can go down, and now he automatically becomes a minuteman and a soldier, <clears throat> because they did it during the revolution. And the other thing is, it doesn't cost the government a nickel to have old Johnny on the farm, but what we want him, we'll take him. So we had militia units before the Civil War, and most of those guys, they got together once a month, and most of the time they were drunk. <laughs> you know that many Civil War soldiers did not know left from right? Now, I don't know how that worked, if you said that it felt. If you go down this road here and take a right, you'll come to Jake's farm. I don't know how that worked, but hey, many of them didn't. Well, the shoes, folks, by the way, were, uh, they weren't left and right foot the shoes. You know. Now, by the way, uh, Montgomery Miggs was the man who put sizes on the clothing. The uniform, yes. He's the one who said, I want him sized. Because, he, because some of them early on were obviously. The word shoddy comes out of this. Shoddy, it's shoddy. Because of uniform, they took the, the scraps from a, a, a textile mill, put them together to make a uniform, they fell apart right away. So that's where shoddy comes from. Among other things. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, that's one thing I heard about Gallows. He, he purchased shoddy goods. But what got him kicked out was not that, uh, as such. Now, I mean, where Simon Cameron walked into the room, there was probably an odor trail, uh, you know, in that sense of, you know, I know, we have, I know we have Cameron County and we have Cameron Avenue, right? You open Cameron Street in Ashburg, probably in Cameron County. Our, our historical society is headquartered at James Cameron, Colonel James Cameron's house, who is the brother of Simon. Oh, yeah, he's killed. Yeah, whoa. But first bull run, in fact. Yes, he's killed right away. Uh, I don't know altogether what he did, but what got him fired is he, you know, he had to do a departmental report if you're head of the department. And he does it without Lincoln's permission, and he recommends that they uh, uh, enlist black soldiers. You can't do that in 61. It, you know, it just took time, right? I mean, Lincoln, I think, is the greatest president. That's just, you know, I just think he is, okay. But I don't know if there's ever been a more astute politician in the White House than Lincoln. All the great presidents have been great politicians, and I mean that in a nice word. You know, the ability to get things done. Yes? Yeah, there's the sad part of this Cameron story, too. James Cameron, Colonel James Cameron, uh, apparently his brother Simon, Actually, uh, Pollock was asked to be the Secretary of Army, who was who became the director of the Mint, James Pollock, who oh. was the governor of Pennsylvania, and he put he got the trust on the coins, and that's what's part of the history of, of Milton. Uh, but uh, his brother, uh, Cam Cameron's brother, uh, James Cameron, with the Cameron House, uh, he had been a soldier early in his life, and then re-enlisted when he was 60. And he was killed in the first battle of the Civil War. But as you said, it was supposed to be a quick war. And it was supposed to be so frivolous that they actually had an audience at the first battle of oh, yeah. uh, Manassas. And apparently, Simon Cameron, the Secretary of the Army, was in the audience that watched while his brother was killed. 
I think I think Cameron went out. I'm not sure, but I do believe he did. A lot numbers of politicians and some wealthy Washingtonians did. One uh, one congressman was captured. He spent six months in living prison in Richmond. You know, and uh, yeah, I did not know that about you know. That I knew James, but I did not know Cameron House. That I did not know. But Simon, he, he, you know, but you know, Lincoln, you know, his cabinet was the people who ran against him for the nomination, and he needed uh, people. Uh, and I like if you were Daniel Sickles. Uh, Daniel Sickles becomes a union general. He's a Tammany Hall lawyer and congressman. He's the one that shot Phil Barton Key and pledged temporary insanity and got off. The Barton Key, Francis Scott Key's son, was having an affair with his young wife, Sickles' young wife. <coughs> but Lincoln didn't care about it. You know, he, he, he could bring Democrats into the, into the war. It's all a matter to Lincoln. But, uh, Abraham Lincoln was the greatest opponent of the South. He was their greatest enemy. And I think if he would have lost the election in 1864, I think he would have managed between then and the March 4th in those days, he would have brought the war to the conclusion. And while we're on Pennsylvania, though, he's from Senate County, where we're from. Andrew Greg Kirk, uh, if you're looking at uh, three of the best Northern War governors, Curtin's in that group. Mm -hmm. Curtin could be pushed number one. There's John Andrew of Massachusetts, Oliver Morton of uh, Indiana. Curtin could be the best. He just got scared to death during the Antietam campaign in Gettysburg. But other than that, Andrew K. Curtin was a great, great supporter of the Union War effort. What's the regiment from around here, so the Pennsylvania regiment? See, back home, it's 148 uh, Pennsylvania. What is it? <coughs> Oh, could be, 28, yeah. By the way, now, any of our questions? Last thing I'll leave you with is a question. Name the only college football state in America named for a Civil War general. Beaver. Beaver State, thank you. <laughs> you know, when I go south, they have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> or do they care? <laughs> Thank you.